Amen. All right, so um, I wanted to start by giving a big thank you to Kevin, who um, helped walk us through the material last week while I was at camp. And I had a chance to go back and listen to the class, and I, I think it was a really beneficial class, so really grateful to him for leading us through. And what we looked at last time, from the end of chapter 2 through chapter 4, focused on dealing with opposition. And so I put a couple review points there because I wasn't here, and I know several of us weren't here. And so um, what we saw at this stage in the book of Nehemiah was these enemies of God's people, mainly Tobiah and Sanballat, and they were mocking the progress of the wall, and they were jeering, and they were plotting and scheming and doing everything in their power to slow down the building of the wall. Um, and we talked in that class about how when we start to do work, and when we start to put ourselves out there for the Lord, it's it's pretty natural result that opposition is going to follow. What I want to do this morning is kind of uh, take some of that same chunk of text and zoom in on the later part of chapter 4. And we're going to kind of move from dealing with opposition as a whole to dealing with discouragement. And so what we're going to be talking about this morning, this morning are things like when, why, and how discouragement comes, how Nehemiah dealt with discouragement, and all along the way, I want to be thinking about what does that mean for us? How can we deal with discouragement? Um, and what can we learn from this section of Nehemiah? So we're going to move um, back a little bit in chapter 4 just to get kind of the context. We're only doing this once a week, so I just want to get our, our minds um, back in the text. So we're going to start reading in chapter 4, verse 1, and read the first 10 verses. But we're mostly going to be focused on the second half of chapter 4. Um, Jake, would you mind to read for us Nehemiah 4, verses 1 through 10? When Sanballat heard that uh, we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews, and he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, uh, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revi <clears throat> revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and the burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. He said, Yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up near it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their, uh, their taunt on their head and give them up to be plundered in a land where, the, where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall, and the wall was joined together to half the site, for the people had a mind to work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ash Ashdodites heard that the, that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward, and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry, and they all, they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as protection against them day and night. In Judah it was said, The strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves we will not be able to rebuild the wall. Okay, thank you. So that last verse, verse 10, is kind of our pivotal verse that we're going to be queuing in on this morning. In Judah it was said, The strength of those who bear the burden is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. So that's the mental condition that the people get themselves in. And what I want to do for a second is back up and look at those first 10 verses and kind of, kind of make a list of how did we get to this, this stage? Um, what are the ways that discouragement came upon the Jews as they tried to rebuild? So what did you see there in those 10 verses um, that led to their discouragement? Good. Okay. Yeah, so they, they start to feel overwhelmed just by the task itself. Great. What else? Mark? All of the people outside of the city who didn't like the fact that the wall was getting ready to be rebuilt yeah. were plotting against going and attacking. So the people inside the city are seeing that and thinking, oh no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So 
they start to hear more and more about these plots that enemies are, are coming up with, and maybe that's wearing on them as time goes on. Good. What else? Before we get to all the way to plotting, I mean, what's kind of happening in verses 1 through 5? They're just making fun of them. Yeah. Um, which is kind of easy to laugh off, but like, if you remember, we're trying to put ourselves in, in the shoes of the people who are going through this. If you think about you're embarking on a great project and maybe there's some uncertainty about if we can do this, and remember that these people... Well, And so they start to build, and all of a sudden, all the people around them are saying, you're never going to finish this. You don't know what you're doing. You're not professional builders. All it's going to take, you're going to build this wall, and a fox is going to climb on it, and it's done. You know, and you just think about the erosive effect that that would have taken just hearing that day after day after day. Because we look at it, and, and we can maybe scoff at it, but I think that the words may have had a bigger impact than we realize. Ryan? And the Jews that ridiculed as well, you see the importance of it. They didn't just shake it off, they were pleading with God not to forgive their sin. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they were just trying to brush off a, a calm insult, it was something really serious. Exactly. Good. So look at the end of verse 5. Um, well, I'll read all of verse 5. But Nehemiah says, Do not cover their guilt. Let not their sin be blotted out for your sight. And look what he says that the insults did. They have provoked you to anger. That's provoked God. So this isn't just needling, needling, trying to get under somebody's skin. He says that they've provoked God to anger because they're doubting and questioning so much whether this can get done. What I want to show you as well, look at verse 7. So before we just had Sanballat and Tobiah that were kind of causing the problems, they're two powerful guys. They had a lot of connections to the Jewish people. They had kind of stepped into the power vacuum in Jewish society. But look at our list now of enemies in verse 7. When Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites. So it's growing a lot, all right? Um, let's take it to the map if I can remember my pointer. Um, Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs. Um, clicker's not on. Un momento. Okay. The Arabs who would be coming up from the south. The Ammonites who are coming from the east. The Ashdodites who are over here in the west. And then Sanballat and Tobiah represent the Samaritans in the north. That's the enemies now. See what we're all four sides, north, south, east, and west, and prominent people and leaders of the opposition. Um, in verse 2, Sanballat said, in the presence of the army of Samaria, that's who he's casting the insults before. And then we get this kind of four-sided opposition, north, south, east, and west. Everybody's starting to come around and converge on Jerusalem and say, oh, they're making progress, and we don't want this to stand. You know, we don't want to see... A, a Jewish state rise up again. And so the opposition is growing. And then as we talked about in verse 8 and 9, no longer are they just happy to insult as they see progress. They're now plotting to come and fight and cause confusion. And we see eventually threats that we're just going to kill the people to stop the work. So the way that we get to this discouragement is through a long and focused effort of opposition. But look through verse, look at verse 6, um, right in the middle of all of this, it says, So we built the wall, and the wall was joined to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. So for a while, the people were able to persevere and push through it. And it even says, we got the wall halfway built. So it wasn't that at the first sign of trouble, the people, they scattered, or they just decided that they couldn't persevere. But after a while, um, they had a hard time going on. Let me ask you, I don't have a slide for that question. Let me ask you, in your experience, when does discouragement typically kick in? When do you find yourself getting discouraged? What are the things that, that lead up to it in your own life? Jonathan? For me, it's usually when I face a problem, I don't think I have an answer. Okay. Good, good. 
So it's something new that we don't necessarily just say, okay, when this happens, I do this. It's something that maybe we didn't see coming um, or that we haven't experienced before. All right, good. What else, Ed? I think uh, just getting started, you know, getting motivated, getting uh, how do we do this. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, so a lot of times it's that it gets to that motivation or what's in our heart. Maybe our resolve's not as strong as we hoped it was. And so, um, you know, we, we may start a project with a lot of enthusiasm and ambition. You know, have you ever done something like that? This is going to be the year that I, that I study my Bible more or that I talk to my coworkers about the gospel more. And we start with vigor and enthusiasm. And then slowly we find ourselves kind of getting weighed down, right? They built half the wall. And in my experience, is the easier half, right? We have the enthusiasm, we're doing something new, we're laying the foundation, but then we find ourselves more and more down and more open and discouraged and like keeping it. Um, I did want to ask as well, why do you think God even allowed enemies to threaten the building of the wall? Right? God is with the people. That's been made very clear. Like, he could have just squashed this threat like a little mug between his fingers. Why do you think that, that enemies were allowed to hang around for a while, Ryan? At the beginning of the class, we discussed the idea of a wall in general and how that was both a physical and a mental barrier to the outside world, the non-chosen. And so to have opposition against the building is just to reaffirm the need for a wall. Mm -hmm. We need a separation, that we need a unified place for God's people that is not in the world. Yeah. Good. Lena? Good, good. And, and those two points are exactly what I wanted to draw out here because we're looking at this story almost as, as an allegory for our own life and building. You know, we look at the literal example of what happened, but then we're taking it to the truth of building ourselves up. And I think it's really telling that God allowed there to be opposition. He allowed people to be railing against it, to be plotting and scheming, to be coming from all directions. And he didn't just put that out instantly. Uh, he did want to build the people up. He wanted them to go through a trial and difficulty. And we won't turn there, but it called to mind uh, James chapter 1 for me about uh, blessed is the man who endures under trial. And that's going to produce steadfastness. And we might think we want it to be easy as we go through the process of being built up for God. But in reality, those moments where we go through opposition and discouragement, when we look back, those are the times that built us up the most. We also said in our intro class that this era of rebuilding the wall is sometimes known as a second exodus, right? So God takes the people from captivity back to the promised land. And think about the first exodus, which the people of Israel would always refer back to in their hard moments, in their Psalms, in their reflections. That was the time where God led us the most. Well, that was a time of great opposition, right? I mean, there was an extremely powerful army bearing down on them. There were trials in the wilderness. There were all kinds of difficulties. And through that, the people learned to trust God. They learned faith. They didn't always get it right, but those obstacles were beneficial for them. And I think in this like second Exodus, we kind of see that happening again, that the enemies and the opposition is not some unplanned thing that, that God just uh, allowed to happen, but rather it's something that he's able to work for his purpose of growing his people. So we talk about when discouragement comes, and, and we were starting to already lay out these principles, that discouragement often comes right in the middle of great work, right? Right at the halfway point, right when we're getting somewhere, that's when discouragement starts to kick in. You notice in these first 10 verses that the more the progress came, the more the opposition came and the more opportunity for discouragement. If you're feeling discouraged, it might just mean that you're onto something and that you're finally starting to make an impact and that the devil or people who don't want to see God's purposes advance are needing to get more aggressive and slowing down. Sometimes when we're just sailing through, maybe that's a red flag that there's not that much of a need for opposition to come to us. And this middle bullet point, even more specifically, I think that discouragement tends to be extra strong right after great success. 
So I'll tell you, I felt a little bit weird getting this lesson together on discouragement coming off camp because I'm feeling pretty fired up and spiritually energized and it was a week of encouragement and I sat down at my computer and I thought, okay, discouragement, you know, like, like, bummer. I'm not in a, I'm not in a discouraged state of mind, you know, maybe give it a few weeks and sometimes the world can beat you up again, but I don't need the lesson on discouragement right now. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, no, I probably do. Because a lot of times it's after that mountain and it's after we start to build to something and it's after we see some success that the discouragement hits us that much harder. And the the fall um, back to reality can be really difficult. And so I asked on the slide, can you think of any Bible examples of this principle that after a great success, people can be prone to discouragement? What comes to mind there? Who said Moses? Yeah, so Moses, I think, is a great example that by the time he's, he has this great encounter with God, but by the time he comes down off the mountain, the people have sinned, and he is really in a state of despair. You could say the same thing about the children of Israel. They come through the Red Sea. It's a great victory. Song of Moses, Exodus 15, we're feeling great. God is our deliverer. Exodus 16, God, why did you lead us out into the wilderness? There's no food. There's no water. We're going to die. You know, I mean, it's just, it is, as soon as we crest that mountain, sometimes we crash pretty hard. Becky, did you have one? This isn't necessarily the person reacting in discouragement, but the more Jesus did in his um, ministry here, the more opposition was raised and ultimately just trying to shut him down. Mm -hmm. And I think um, a lot of times what is the most discouraging is our own brethren discourage each other because we're not being like Jesus and loving and being unified the way we should be. So like you go to a week of camp and you're so encouraged because these kids faith and sometimes we go back to our home congregations and people aren't loving each other. And yeah. It's really hard. Good. Good. So I, we're going to touch on that a little bit later of discouragement from outside versus discouragement from inside versus discouragement from ourselves and kind of the difficulties of dealing with all those different things. I saw a couple of hands, Mark. Uh, Steve uh, texted in a comment. All right. Um, Peter walking out to Jesus on the water is a good example of this. That is a good example. That's a really good example that I hadn't thought of, of that moment of, of you're walking on the water and you can't imagine getting any, any closer to the Lord than that, but then the doubt starts to creep in right at that point. Jay? Um, I wouldn't say that it's easy to deal with the external uh, opposition, but you expect it, at least. Mm -hmm. What you don't expect is the internal opposition. So yeah, if there's something that you're working on and, and you're surprised, if there's some sort of surprise, if there's something I'm doing and I get opposition internally. I mean, I can think of a specific example, but it happens. It happens to all of us. Yep. And you think, why as Christians are we not working together on this, building the wall mm -hmm. together? Why are you opposing me on yeah. this? What, what's, so then like my mind has been distracted as to what's your agenda? What's wrong with you? What's mm -hmm. wrong with me now that I can't deal with what's wrong with you? Yeah. So like, wow, the devil worked really well for that whole situation. Good, good. Dave? I was thinking about Steve and how at the pinnacle of his preaching, the lesson and exposing to his brethren, this is the gospel for you. Listen to it, remember what you've passed and what you've been taught, and they stone him for it. Yeah. And after all that great success, discouragement, and yet that sends the gospel. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that was the book of Acts was kind of the other one that I was thinking of, because the more that the Christians seem to do, the more fierce the pushback gets. And Stephen's a great example. Uh, I had Paul in Ephesus and he stays for a while. And once he starts to make a lot of converts, then those who are made their living by idolatry look up and say, no more. You know, we're not going to let this abide. And one more maybe to think about. And it's, it's not a literal example, but in the parable of the sower, there are four types of soil. And of the three who's, who are going to receive the gospel, two of them don't make it due to discouragement, due to temptations and trials. So Jesus says, of those even who will accept the gospel, you better be prepared that there's going to be an initial shoot up of joy. And it's so great and it's exciting and you're wanting to be part of the family. But he talks specifically in the rocky soil about tribulation and persecution and opposition and discouragement comes 
and you just don't stick it out because it's really difficult to deal with. I want us to move ahead to sort of the sources of discouragement and how um, we get discouraged because that's kind of where our conversation was moving. Um, Mark, would you read verses 11 and 12 for us, please? And our enemies said, they will not know or see until we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. Okay, so we talked about when discouragement comes. Here's how discouragement comes. So first, it's from without. It's from the enemies. And that one's kind of obvious. Verse 11, the enemies say, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. Okay, obvious source of discouragement. People threatening to come and kill you. But verse 12 is kind of interesting because um, look who's talking. At that time, the Jews who lived near came from all directions and said 10 times, you must return to us. Um or maybe some translations will say something like, they are coming against us. And so I think we can see a little bit of discouragement from outside and discouragement from inside. One thing I will say, it seems in the study that I did, like the Jews who come and warn them, they're not trying to discourage necessarily. Um, it seems like maybe these guys were watchmen or were spies or were kind of trying to tip them off. But still, wouldn't it be discouraging that you're building the wall and you're making progress and then your neighbors come and say, Hey, this time's for real. I heard the plot. They're coming to get us. And you worry and you maybe stop the work for a minute and you look around and okay, nothing happened. And then you rinse and repeat that nine more times, right? Ten times somebody comes up and says, they're coming. You must return to us. You better stop and come home if you want to be safe. Even with good intentions, wouldn't that be discouraging? Wouldn't you start to feel worn down? Wouldn't you start to question everything that's going on? And so I wrote down this discussion question, and I think our minds were already starting to go there from some of the comments. Uh, what do you think is the difference between discouragement from our brethren versus discouragement from outside versus discouragement just from within ourselves? And which one of those do you find the most difficult to deal with? So I just want to kind of open up the floor and, and get your thoughts. When you find yourself discouraged, which one of these do you think is, is the most difficult? Certainly no right or wrong answer. Just kind of want to get us thinking a little bit. Mark? I think the most difficult for me would be if we had discouragement from our own, from within. Because uh, you have to think that they have your best interest at heart. And then they're bringing this uh, news that you've got to stop. You've got to do this. It's contrary to the work you're trying to do. Um, and that's hard to, to battle against because you, one, you don't want to offend your brother, right? You don't want to tell him, no, I'm not going to do what you're telling me to do. But you also want to do the work and, and you're caught between uh, that decision. You know, do I keep on the work or do I not do the work? You know, it, that's a difficult one. If it's from the outside, you're, you don't really care so much about the outside uh, as far as their feelings or, or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should, but we usually don't. Um, and then from my own heart, I, I think it would not be as difficult, maybe because I could talk to you and, or talk to someone else and, and, and help build myself up. But uh, from within, is the worst. Good. Good. Uh, let's get a couple other perspectives. Tim? In our study on elders last quarter, I think this was a prominent thing when it came to uh, building up elders and uh, making them feel better uh, about the job they're doing even when times are difficult. And so I think from the elders' perspective, this is definitely uh, the worst time that the problems when you get that, that kind of uh, feeling that you get that this is really something very difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. And how do you deal with it? And still most of the situation. Yeah, good, good. Anybody else? So I think for me, the answer is kind of that it depends which one is the most difficult sort of based on the moment and the situation. Sometimes the outside is easy to sort of block off and we just expect opposition, but sometimes it's also the most belligerent, you know, and I mean, these enemies are, they're just in your face. What are you doing? You're going the wrong direction. And after a while, that just gets old sometimes. We talked about how difficult discouragement from within is because 
we're looking to each other. This is supposed to be our safe haven to build one another up. And so when the opposite happens and people are pulling us down, that can really weigh on us. And I think verse 10 is somewhat of an example of from within our own hearts, the way that it says in Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burden is failing. There's too much rubble. We can't rebuild the wall. Like those things were being said, but I think they were being thought and internalized first, you know, like just that nagging voice in our own heads and our own hearts that I can't really do this. I can't really follow through on this. It's too much for me. And if we will pull those things into the light and get encouragement, we can make it through. But if we want to just cling on to those, um, sometimes it becomes a lot for us to bear. Did you have something, Virginia? Yeah. I think, too, if you think about your expectations for both the internal and the external, is often where discouragement comes from because you don't expect. When you raise your expectations of those things and think that people are going to react a certain way internally or externally and start to put confidence in them reacting a certain way, you get discouraged. So I can see here where, like, you're supposed to have our back. You're not supposed to be telling us to come home. You know, your expectation is one thing. So it's changing our mindsets to realize expectations of this world are always going to disappoint us and not to live and put so much hope and stock in other people or you know external or internal factors but to be confident in what god has said good and we need to experience that those things in order to grow in those realizing expectations are not of this world good good thought so i want to put this question up and just let you think about it for a second how real of a threat was the opposition to the wall Dave, you said very. For me, it's like Lena was saying, it's, it's an attack on their faith. And if they're going to be faithful, they have to face it. Mm -hmm. And not avoid it, not succumb to it. And that's really where the heart of the matter is, is their internalizing of the opposition. And if they're going to allow God to encourage them through it, with Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. So um, I, like, I like that thought. I think it is very real. And what, in just a moment, we're going to read the rest of the chapter, 13 through 23. And I think you'll, you'll see how real it is by the great lengths that the, pe that the people go to to defend themselves and that Nehemiah puts into place. But I think there may be two sides to this answer, right? It's very real. It's very threatening. It's very serious. At the same time, was God going to let this project fail? Of course not. The easy for us in hindsight, not easy for them in the moment. But think about what had already happened. God had moved the heart of a pagan king to release the people in the days of Cyrus. He'd moved another pagan king to allow Nehemiah to come home, to give him supplies, to give him everything he needed. He'd moved the people to have a heart to work, and the wall was halfway done. He'd kept the opposition at bay so far. Was God going to let this fail? Absolutely not. And did anything come of the threats? No. But I say that not to ridicule the people. Clearly, it's a very real threat. But it's just sort of interesting for us to note in hindsight, this felt so serious and so threatening. But I think at least some small part of that is that in discouragement, our threats seem bigger. And all that happened in reality was plots and words and people saying, we're going to come get you. And they never do. But that's almost beside the point, because just the idea that they might or that they could be coming, just the, the thought, the impression of opposition is sometimes enough to slow us down. And sometimes we build up the opposition in our heads so much that it can be hard to move forward. And I think it's worth taking a look in the mirror every now and then and surveying the situation accurately and saying, it did feel huge. We did need to defend against it, but God is bigger. And when we put things in the right perspective, maybe this threat wasn't quite all that it seemed. Again, not piling on the people, just trying to make the observation that um, God had it under control the whole time. And if we can see that looking backwards, hopefully it will help us looking forward in our own life when we start to see all the trouble piling up. Very quickly on why discouragement comes, this is derived from verse 10. Um, one of the materials that I was reading talked about a loss of strength, a loss of vision, a loss of confidence, and a loss of security. And just for the sake of time, we won't unpack all of those things. But 
you can see in verse 10 that all of a sudden the people were no longer looking at the half-built wall and all the great progress. They started focusing on the rubble. Oh, there's still a lot to do. Oh, there's a lot of opposition. Had any of that changed since the beginning of the project? No. But weariness and discouragement can set in over time. We talked about the cumulative effect of just people constantly trying to slow us down. And at a certain point, the threats, uh, the difficulty, the rubble just became a lot for the people to bear. But I want to read verses 13 through 23 and spend the last part of our class thinking about how the opposition and how the discouragement was overcome. Um, Dave, would you mind to read verses 13 through 23 for us? Thank you. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their plants, with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, and to the officials, and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Through the end of the chapter. Okay. Yep, thanks. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my service worked on construction, and half on the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah, who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side when he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, The work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet rallying to us there, our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night, and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. Thank you. All right, so before I get into my list of the strategies that were used to overcome discouragement, I want to hear from you. What did you see in those verses for how the people were able to get through their discouragement. Ryan? It's almost verbatim Exodus language. In the beginning of Deuteronomy where Moses were recounting what happened and in the deliverance he says this, the Lord your God goes before you for he himself will fight on your behalf just as he did for you in the land of Egypt before your own eyes. In the wilderness where he saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son. I think you put up those four points right there. And all of those are solutions that God can provide. I don't know any greater comfort than when we were like, what, five years old and your dad would carry you from the couch. And from the that's the language that's being used. Um, and so it's the recounting of the Exodus story that's giving them strength. Good. Great thought. What else do you see? Maria? Well, they shifted, they turned their focus back on the Lord. Mm hmm Yep. And so once they did that, all of this... Good. So who's the hero in the book of Nehemiah? With conviction, who is the hero in the book of Nehemiah? God. God. Excellent. So if I can only impart one thing from the study, I want it to be that. This is not a book about how awesome Nehemiah is, although he's pretty cool. Uh, this is a book about God's deliverance. And the first thing that we see for overcoming discouragement is that Nehemiah directed the people's attention to the Lord. I'm glad that that was first thing on your minds too. In verse 14, he says, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And then he goes on. The Lord is the hero in the book of Nehemiah. And when he says, remember the Lord, I like what Ryan referenced, calling to mind the things that the Lord has done. This is not just remember that there is a God or remember that he's your God. It's a very intentional, deliberate, thoughtful, think back on what the Lord has done. Think on who he is. Think on his ability to deliver you and let that be a guide and a comfort and a strength. I thought of Philippians 4, 6, and 7 about um, 
In everything, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. So when the discouragement starts to come, when adversity heads our way, direct our attention back to the Lord. And look at verse 15. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we returned to the wall, each to his work. So not only does Nehemiah direct attention on the front end that the Lord can get us through, but when he does, he said... God frustrated their plan. It wasn't that we were so hardy and we were so strong and we were so faithful. God frustrated their plan and he gives God the credit for pulling them through. Another thing I think we see is that the people pursue both faith and action. I'm going to reread a few of these verses and kind of show you what I mean by that. Let's start in verse 14. I looked and arose and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord faith, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Action. Verse 15, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, faith, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. Action. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leader stood behind the house of Judah, who were building the wall. Those who carried the burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand. Faith, we continue to work on the wall amidst opposition. We trust God. And held his weapon with the other. Action. So what do you think is the significance of this this dual faith and action? What can we learn from that principle? Andrew? Mm-hmm. And so when we pray, we trust that he's willing and able, then we also go out and do. Yeah. There's a, a cool old phrase from the Revolutionary War where they would say, trust in the Lord, but keep your powder dry. Like, first, our confidence is in God, but there's also a responsibility of things that we have to do. And I love the, the duality of that. James chapter 2 will say, faith without works is dead. So the people did not just, as opposition came, pray to God and, you know, sit around and wait for for magical deliverance to fall from heaven like manna. But they also didn't just gather around, get in their war room, assemble, who's got the best idea, let's make a subcommittee, let me put my generals here and go forward without consulting God. Their first priority was to consult God in prayer and faith and turn to him. If we don't do that, we've got nothing. But there is also an action that follows along that says, I've prayed, I've sought the Lord's counsel, I'll continue to, and I'm going to make the best decision I can on what the next logical steps are and use the mind and use the faith that God has given me to go out and pursue the steps that are going to help. And so I just I love, I love that balance. You can even see that with the sword on one on the other, right? I'm going to trust in the Lord to continue to work and continue to lay bricks, even though I know there are enemy forces kind of just beyond my line of sight, but I'm also going to have a sport and I'm also going to be ready to defend myself. All right, number three, harness the power of the group. So notice in verse 13 that Nehemiah sets up in open places the people by their clans with their swords and their spears and their bows. And at the end of verse 14, he tells them, fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. So there is a sense of collectivism. I think it's one of the best ways of overcoming discouragement because discouragement has a way of making us feel alone. One of the examples that you might have thought of of someone who was discouraged after a great victory is Elijah. And Elijah runs off to the cave after his victory at Mount Carmel, and he says... God, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one, and I can't do it anymore. And you wonder if the people here were feeling some of that too. And, and in 1 Kings 19, God says, no, you're not. There's 7,000 others, 
and I'm going to give you a successor in Elisha. You're not the only one. And that seems to be part of what gives him the strength to keep going. Well, here we've seen the people kind of feeling the temptation to give in to discouragement and say, it's just too much. There's too much rubble. We can't do it. Remember, their enemies coming from north, south, east, and west. They're all over the place. And Nehemiah pulls the people together. He gets them in clans. He sorts them by their family. He puts them in a military company. And he says, remember that you're fighting not just for yourself and not just by yourself, but with other people. There's a strength in that. Look to how he engages the leaders of the people. Verse 14, he says to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people. That's who he gives instructions to. In verse 16, it says at the end of verse 16, that the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah. And in verse 19, I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people. So Nehemiah not only got the whole congregation together, but he tapped certain leaders on the shoulder and he said, I need you guys to carry the torch here. I need you all to be strong. One of the things I like about the leadership philosophy of Nehemiah is he didn't mind to work with other leaders. He wasn't threatened by them. It wasn't all about Nehemiah. He gathers the leaders around in this time of crisis and he says, here's what we're going to do. And he allows other people to go out and work with him. He harnesses the strength of the group. There is also a serve one another mentality. So look at the last few verses here. As he gets the army together, he sets everybody up with the building tool on one hand, the sword on the other, and he arranges for a watch system to where, okay, if there's going to be a breach in the wall, I've got a trumpeter, he's going to blow the trumpet, and you assemble to where you need to be. In verses 21 through 23, Nehemiah realizes, we need a night guard. So, in verse 22, I said to the people at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So we know from chapter 7 and verse 4 that very few people were actually living in Jerusalem. So imagine the work on the wall getting done all day, and everybody commutes back out to the suburbs and kind of leaves the wall and leaves the city super vulnerable. And so as the opposition increases, Nehemiah said, we need to be serving each other and looking out for each other. And I know probably no one is that eager to lay down here amidst the rubble, away from your home, and take the dangerous job of the night guard, but I need some people to do it. And what I love in verse 23 is that he says, neither I, nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes and we kept our weapons. So who are the first volunteers for the night guard? Nehemiah and his right hand. need to get through this together. So by way of application, I just want you to think about those four points the next time that, that we run into discouragement. Be prepared for it. Be ready for it. Often when we feel like we're going to make the breakthrough or we are making a breakthrough, that's when discouragement can be the most potent. But by keeping our eyes on the Lord, working with faith and action together, harnessing the power of the group and serving one another, I think these are, are timeless So for next time, we'll be in chapter 5, and I want you to be thinking, read that text please, and be thinking about the issues of money and lending and class conflict between the rich and the poor. Um, we see a different type of issue emerge in chapter 5, and I think it'll be really beneficial if you've, you've read up on that and you're prepared to discuss it. Thank you guys so much for your good comments this morning. Enjoyed the class.